process for us to talk about is the production process. The nice thing about this is as we you know, kind of move from process to process. There's a lot of things that we have already talked about that we can just say, well, we don't have to talk about that again. We've already talked about it. And so we really will be able to spend just a little bit of time in certain things of a preliminary nature and jump more into the actual guts of the process. The way we will cover the production process, we'll talk about basic concepts, We'll talk about the organizational levels that are relevant to the production process. We have some new ones here. We will talk about master data relevant to the production process. Once again, we've got some new things here. And then we will talk about the production process itself. The production process looks quite a bit different uh, from other processes in that it can decompose in different fashions. But on a very basic level, uh, these are the steps in a very basic production process. We have a request for production, which according to this figure comes to us from the warehouse, but as we will discuss, in fact, it can come from any number of different sources. So we have this request for production, which you might hopefully remember the document that goes with this. This would be a, a planned order. You saw that in the context of your ERP SIM experience. Um, authorized production, this is going to be the production order, which once again you saw in the context of ERP SIM. And then after that, issuing of raw materials, the actual creating of the product itself, and then the receipt of finished goods back into the warehouse to signify the end of the process. So some of those involve a fair amount of work and have a lot of detail in them. Um, but notice here that if we're thinking in terms of triggers and other things of that sort, uh, the trigger for the production process, this guy right here, would be the planned order coming in, which serves as the trigger. So before we get into that, let, let's talk about some production concepts. There are, in fact, different types of manufacturing. And your book doesn't really talk much about this, but I do think it's worthy of our attention and note here. Probably what most of us think about when we think about manufacturing and factories and <coughs> things like that, probably what most of us visualize would be what's called discrete manufacturing. Discrete manufacturing is where we are making units of countable products. So imagine you know, the typical assembly line that is making cars, or that is making uh, bicycles, or whatever. And you can just kind of visualize standing at the end of the production line and seeing the bicycles or the cars or the whatever roll off. And you could just stand there and say one bicycle, two bicycles, three bicycles. You could count them. They're individually countable units. Uh, so the key characteristic of discrete manufacturing is this idea of individual or separate unit production. And it is used for just a huge array of products, cars, toys, consumer electronics, auto parts, you know, you name it. And of course, what this opens up for us is one of the, the big things that is being looked at here, of course, is uh, to what degree we need humans involved in this or to what degree we can employ robotics. And then the other facet of this is, is this idea of, of custom manufacturing. You know, this is something that has been talked about for a long time. We're not quite there yet with any degree of, of uh, sophistication yet. But the idea of realizing that really when you get right down to it, a fully robotic manufacturing line is not that different than a printer that you might have hooked up to your computer. And as a point of fact, uh, we may be able to in the future for you to say, I want this kind of product. 
and you build it using some kind of app on your smartphone or on your computer and you pay for it and then you send it to a manufacturing plant for them to build it and ship it to you. And so this idea of custom manufacturing is something that's really, really interesting. One example of this, and I don't know if I can, I can pull this up, I, I haven't looked at it recently, and I've never purchased one of these products, so I'd be curious to see if any of you have, but uh, Nike does their, um, I think they call it Nike ID, where you can uh, go to Nike and order a, a highly customized shoe. And, and the way this works is um, customize. You can go in and say, okay, I want to build a shoe. See if this will actually work on my computer. Okay, you design it. Let's get started. Okay, so I want uh, this kind of shoe and I want this base model. And then it'll let you go in and you can pick the colors and the laces and the design to print on the sole. And when I've done this before, when the websites actually work, I usually make it a goal to try and make the ugliest possible shoe I could visualize here. You know, so you just start here and you say, okay, I want the, the shoe to be Rio Teal. Uh, check. And I don't, done, I'm not done. Their site, I don't know whether people actually use it because every time I've tried, it, it's an exercise in frustration to actually get it to work. Um, but in theory, you can actually make your own shoe that looks exactly like you want it to look and, and you pay a little bit more for it. And the surprising thing is, it does cost more than an off-the-shelf <coughs> shoe, but it's not like it costs you $1,000. It costs you maybe $20 or $25 more than what an off-the-shelf shoe would be. Well, the thought is that as robots get more sophisticated, as computers get more sophisticated, as manufacturing gets more sophisticated, you'll be able to do this with a wide variety of products. You know, imagine instead of going to a car lot and actually picking out the car you want, you drive a car, you decide you want this kind, and then you go online and you pick the exact color you want for the interior, the exterior, you choose all of these different features, and you could create a car that totally is reflective of your interest and your style. That's the idea here. And everyone foresees that happening uh, but, but we're not yet there in terms of sophistication, but I'm quite confident you will see more and more of this uh, in, your, in your lifetime. We already see it with certain things like clothing, but you'll start seeing it more with other areas as well. So that's discrete manufacturing. Comments or, or questions or such about that. Anybody seen any other examples of this? highly custom manufacturing? Anybody bought anything like that that would fall into that category? Yeah, I remember, um, I know in high school, I came up with one that I borrowed uh, from Nike made in the USA. And did, were you happy with the results? Yeah. yeah. I think it's, um, you know, Nike does it with kind of sports shoes. Uh, so Timberland will let you do that with the kind of products that they make, those kind of hiking shoes or whatever they categorize themselves as. Um, anybody done anything else in a different kind of product? Sleep number does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be, the, and, and there are some things like that that you go to a store and you kind of design the product in the store and then have it made and shipped to you. So. You know, I, I think you'll see more and more of that. Well, that's discrete manufacturing. The other kind of manufacturing, um, it's called process manufacturing. And, and this is more like what you would see if you went over to Eastman Chemical. At Eastman Chemical, it's not like you stand at the end of the line and can say, okay, one beaker of chemicals, two beaker of chemicals, and you see them rolling off in that fashion. It's more just almost like a, a pipeline 
where there's this continuous flow of product that's always running out of uh, the production process. And you see this with paint, chemicals, really anything liquid would fall into this category. But there are other things that fall into this kind of where you're just making batches on an ongoing basis. Um, ketchup. Um, all of you, I'm sure, purchase and consume ketchup, but typically when you buy ketchup, if you're at a store, you buy a bottle of it. If you go out to eat at a restaurant, they might give you a little pouch or cup or whatever, but actually you can buy ketchup by the tanker, like a gas tanker. And that's, if you were to go to the factory where they make ketchup, that's what they do. They just make a continuous stream of ketchup and then at the end of the line they put it in vats or they put it in tankers or or whatever have you and it would not be unusual for them to put it in a tanker and then the tanker drives to another facility which actually puts it in the little pouches and the actual chemical processing plant itself just operates on a continuous basis near where I used to live in South Carolina there is a Campbell soup factory um, bizarre slash scary place because if you were to watch what you would see is truck after truck after truck of chickens heading in and then tanker after tanker after tanker of chicken broth heading out okay <laughs> and and I knew some people that their job was to I don't know what the term was and I apologize, at least it's not like 8 a.m., but their job was to deheadify the chicken, okay? Um, and, and that's what they would do. They would just process the chickens and they would make the chicken broth that then served as base for making other soup. They stood out on a continuous basis. And it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like they were starting and stopping or they were just making this units. It was just every day, come in, process the chickens, out comes chicken broth on an ongoing basis on a continuous continuous nature. That's process manufacturing. And there are a lot of companies that engage in that, of which I, I give you the example, a lot of what you would see at Eastman Chemical would fall into that category. Yes, sir. Are there uh, products that are a hybrid between a fragment of uh, a material product like broth and stock? Are Right. I, I think you're right that that um, there are things that are are hybrids. Um, it really has to do with how we view the manufacturing process. Do we view it as something that we just fire it up and it keeps going forever, or do we view it as something where we're going to make you know 25,000 boxes of blueberry muesli and then we're going to make 25,000 boxes of strawberry muesli? Are we thinking like that, which would be discreet, or are we just thinking of, okay, today we're gonna make as much of whatever as we can, and we do that every day. <coughs> um, I, I toured, for an example, a couple of years ago, I guess it's been at this point, a building that is on the Eastman Chemical plant, and um, am amazing in that uh, the gentleman who took me on the tour had to get special permission to, to walk me through there because they consider it uh, a highly secure area because they use several very custom processes. The building itself, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say, was easily the size of three football fields, okay? It just seemed to keep going forever. And this gentleman who took me on the tour had, had worked there had worked at Eastman for decades and he actually got started working in in that building and he said when he first started working there when you walked into that building there were just people everywhere he said hundreds of people used to work in that building and and it was just people everywhere and what was amazing to me is as we took the tour that day we probably saw 12 people and most of those were were maintenance people everything else was was robots and automation and in fact we had to be careful because on the on the floor there were there were like robot highways if you will 
where you had to be, you know, at least be careful. Uh, the robot, in theory, if it saw you, would stop and not run you over. But there were robots driving around with stuff, and there were rooms that he he took me in where it was just they where it was the yarn factory. And they call it yarn, but it's actually their acetate thread. And there were just these machines making that acetate thread as fast as they could. It was just kind of mind-boggling to see just all of this stuff happening. And in most of it, there would be like all of this work happening, and then worker, one worker sitting there on a stool just kind of watching it all happen so that like if something blew up or something happened that wasn't supposed to, they could call somebody. But otherwise, the work was just being done in a totally automated fashion, and that's what they did. Just every day, all day, uh, that factory was making stuff. That's the idea behind, behind process manufacturing. And this is extremely automated in a, in a contemporary environment, because what we're talking about here is, is repetitive manufacturing, where the same or very similar products are produced over a, a period of time. And so we think in terms of, okay, let's make this many units um, next. And we tend to think of repetitive manufacturing in terms of we have the ability to make 25,000 units a day. And of course, the way you think of this could be how many units can we make an hour or a minute or a day or a week. You know, you could easily convert from one base to the other, but we typically think of it in terms of that. And, and what do we call statements like this right here? You know, we can make 25,000 units a day. What's the, what's the formal term for that? Capacity, yeah, that's what we're talking about here. So repetitive manufacturing revolves around this concept of capacity. What do we have the capacity to make in an hour, in a week, in a year, whatever have you. And so we think in terms of in repetitive manufacturing, we take our manufacturing process, we decompose it into a series of steps, and then we optimize those steps. It's uh, interesting, a gentleman who some of you might have heard of in the context of um, an economics class, Adam Smith, uh, talked about this. And he actually talked about going into a factory that made, that made pins like you would use for sewing or, or pinning fabric. And he talked about how it was job of one person to pull the metal and another person to hammer it and another person did this. And they had taken that process and decomposed it into a sequence of steps. And you know, of course, once you do that, that a worker should be able to do this many in an hour or this many in a minute. And you achieve that, that repeatability. Well, we do the same thing today. But of course, now we're employing a lot of automation, as we've been talking about here, a lot of robots. But we do a lot of repetitive manufacturing. It's not on my slide, but the other option we would have would be what we've talked about here, which is custom manufacturing. Um, maybe you've seen like some TV shows where somebody takes their car to a car uh, place and, and they make a one-off version of that car. They paint it with a unique paint scheme, they put unique seats in it, they do something of a very custom nature, and that's then a very unique creation. Well, that would be custom manufacturing. Anytime we think of in terms of we're making stuff, but it's not we're making large lots of the same thing over and over again, we're doing things of a much more custom nature. Sometimes in business, you see businesses that do some of both. Great example of that that I like to use would be if you were to go to a, a cake shop. That cake shop might make wedding cakes or special event cakes that would be very custom, but then they might also make birthday cakes or donuts or cookies, things on an ongoing basis that they have out uh, for customer display for people to just walk in and pick up. So you have discrete manufacturing or process manufacturing, you have repetitive manufacturing or custom manufacturing, some kind of terms that go along with the execution of manufacturing in organizations. Of course, not every organization 
engages in manufacturing. And so this particular process we are about to discuss may not be something that our particular business actually engages in. <coughs> Unlike procurement and fulfillment, which are fairly universal, there are a lot of companies out there that don't actually engage in manufacturing as a part of their business process. Walmart would be a great example of a company of that sort. Comments or questions about any of this uh, before we forge ahead? What would Coca-Cola be an example of? Yeah, I think that would be process repetitive manufacturing. Anybody think of another example of process other than paints or chemicals? Yeah, petroleum products would be a great example of process manufacturing, probably one of the largest process manufacturing industries in this country. That's a great example of that. All right, so types of manufacturing, manufacturing strategies. Some of these we have alluded to. At least one of these you have experienced in the context of your ERP SIM. There are some companies, when it comes to manufacturing, consider themselves to be make-to-stock companies. And the idea behind a make-to-stock company is we make things and we put them in stock. And then we sell out of that stock. So if you think about that at a high level, what that actually means is our sales process and our production process are decoupled. It doesn't really matter what orders we took in today, last week, or what orders we're going to take in tomorrow. We think in terms of manufacturing independent of that. Now, if we're smart, we might allow sales information to be the basis of what we decide to produce. But it's not like we're sitting there waiting for orders to come in before we fire up the assembly line and we start making things. As I've mentioned a couple of times, your ERP SIM companies are examples of make-to-stock companies. Make-to-order, we make things in response to specific orders we have taken in from customers. So the idea here is that our production is really just a function of those orders that we have taken in from customers. Now, depending upon what it is that we are making, we may try and batch up like kinds of customer orders so that we can send through batches of similar products to pick up some manufacturing efficiency. But fundamentally, we don't make anything until we actually have a specific order. One example that I like to use here of, of this illustrates kind of the potential problem with make to order is if we think in terms of a uh, barber shop, I missed an R there, barber shop or, or hair salon, okay? Well, if you worked at a barber shop or a hair salon doing people's hair, then your production is going to be very specifically driven by sales orders because the customer is going to come in, they're going to sit in your chair and tell you what they want, and then you do it for them. If no customers come in, it's not like you can say, grab some wigs out of the back and let me cut them and save them for the future. And then when customers come in, you can say, oh, I have a wig that matches that. Here, take this and wear this instead and use that as a way of getting caught up. Doesn't work that way. You know, you have to make the item in response to the actual specific customer order, which means if you don't have an order, um, you, you may, uh, you know, have a lot of time on your hands that's not actually productive time. Other options we have are make to assemble and assemble to order. Well, let's talk about the last of these first. Assemble to order is the same idea as make to order, but I'm not actually waiting until I get the order to start work. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm making pieces and then when I get an order from a customer, I put those pieces together. Can anybody give me an example of a company you might be familiar with 
that follows the assemble to order strategy. Yes, sir. I think so. Because presumably when they say build your own car, they're not really going to let you build it from scratch. It's more like they have some modules that, that you can kind of tell them to put together in a certain way. So that would be an example of that. What else? Yes, sir. Now, right idea, and, and it could be handled that way. What you probably would find if you really investigated is that in most instances, that company is a make-to-stock company, and they're just going to find where they already made that truck, and it's sitting in Atlanta, and they'll ship it to you. But hypothetically, if they really did wait to the last minute, sure, it'd be that kind of thing. Best example I can give you and I don't know to what degree you've ordered from this company, but you've all seen their products, is Dell, Dell Computer. Uh, you go to their website and you say, I would like a computer. And they say, OK, pick a model, which is a fancy way of saying pick a case and a motherboard. And you do that. And then they say, OK, how much RAM do you want? Do you want a hard drive or do you want an SSD drive? And they ask you all of these, these questions. And then when you're done, they, they check to make sure that everything that you've put together actually works together, and then they take your order. And then what happens is people that work in their factory, they're not really manufacturing your PC from scratch, but they're going around to different shelves and bins and picking the parts and then putting them together and, and shipping you the computer. So what they're engaged in is assemble to order make to assemble would be if you could imagine the same kind of thing but we manufacture the items and then put them in the assembly area and then we wait for customers orders to come in and and we assemble them at that point so the distinction here with assemble to order if you actually go to the dell website you'd see that they're not putting a dell brand hard drive in your computer you know, they're buying hard drives from hard drive companies. They're buying RAM memory from RAM companies. Really, a lot of what they're doing is buying finished materials. And it's almost, it's almost like a trading good. But instead of them buying all these parts and then shipping you the parts, they're buying all these parts, putting them together into a computer with a Dell label on the outside of it, and then shipping that to you. So Dell would be an example of assemble to order, make to assemble. I'm trying to think of a company that would do this. And, and probably a make to assemble company would be like IKEA, because they make stuff that's like disassembled. And let's assume that you're going to actually get them to assemble it for you. Then when you place an order for a particular product, they'll put it together. That's not a great example of that. But off the top of my head, that would be one company that would be an example of that. Um, anybody think of any other examples, perhaps, of a make to assemble company? Yes, sir. I think so. I think that you could make the case that that Nike, the Nike scenario we talked about, it, that could be seen as make to order, but it could also be seen as make to assemble because then they're assembling it to order. If we're just talking about like switching out the laces and other things like that, you know, there, there's a point at which it kind of becomes assembly versus manufacturing, and that's a very very fuzzy line there. But yeah, I think that's a reasonable example of that. Anybody think of any others? Yes, sir. The difference again between the make to assemble and assemble to order is you're, with the make is so simple, you're kind of manufacturing the parts. Yeah, you're making the parts, and then you're holding the parts and then assembly to order. And then with assemble to order, you're, uh, you're purchasing like semi finished goods or something like that, mm -hmm. and then assembling once the order comes in. Yep, exactly so. Exactly so. You got that exactly right. Comment, other comments or questions? 
All right, well, this is a great place for us to stop for today, and so we will do that. And then when we get together uh, later this week, we will talk about organizational data and master data and continue on in our coverage of the manufacturing process.